Thank you, Vanessa. Well, it's, it's wonderful to speak here after such nice introductions of the previous two speakers. So, before we go to the use of um, genetics in trials, I'd like to take you a little bit on the route towards what we know about the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. And starting, of course, with an open door that most of us know is that the apolipoprotein E gene and H are the most important drivers of Alzheimer's disease in the general population. Now, why I like this slide, it's based on the Rotterdam study, which is a large population-based follow-up study, is that uh, not many people always appreciate how much the differences are in age of onset uh, of the disease uh, across the APOE genotype itself. And if you look at this slide, the APOE44 carriers, you see that on average the age of onset uh, is about uh, five to 10 years earlier uh, then compared to uh, APOE3-3 carriers, which is the normal uh, genotype as we know it. What we also see that the difference between APOE3-3 and the APOE2 carriers, the green and the blue line, is not that dramatic. And uh, that also gives us an appreciation that we are looking at, of course, on a two-edged sword, sword, that on the one hand APOE4 increases the risk, also APOE2 it decreases the risk, but not as uh, dramatic as APOE4. Now, there's many more genes, and uh, one of the most recent studies uh, is one of the uh, European Alzheimer's disease uh, database study, in uh, which we uh, studied more than 100,000 um, clinically diagnosed Alzheimer patients, as well as proxy cases from a UK biobank. And that gives you a little bit on an idea of the landscape of Alzheimer's disease and the genes involved in it. And of course, the major ones in it, and you probably cannot read it, is APOE uh, and clusterin, BIN1, um, the CR1 gene uh, highlighting the innate immune system, and uh, PCAM. But many more, and one of the effects of the study design that we have uh, chosen here is that we see also genes popping up that we are used to see in other diseases. So granulin is one that we are often uh, expect to see rather in uh, uh, ALS or FDD. And uh, there's also a, a number of really uh, genes that earlier popped up in Parkinson's disease. So how to take these numbers of genes uh, to um, clinical trials? What we are facing now is over 80 genes that are involved in Alzheimer's disease. Well, most of us have realized that what we do, and this is actually uh, an approach that was already proposed by R.A. Fisher in the previous century before even the, the sequence of DNA was known, is that uh, we try to add up the effects mathematically of the different variants that we find based on their effects uh, and their effect size. And what one expects then theoretically to see that uh, your genetic risk score as we construct it, a polygenetic risk score based on all genes that are a bit associated or genetic risk score that are genome-wide significant, your risk score takes up an, a kind of a normal distribution. And then you get a distribution as we are used to in other clinical settings, like blood pressure is more or less uh, uh, normally distributed, and those in the extremes have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease and a low risk of, uh, of course, in the low extreme, a low risk of uh, vascular disorders. Now, what do we see for the Alzheimer genes? Well, the strange thing is, and we see it's not unique, but it's not normal, of course, because we see if we make a genetic risk score without the APOE gene, and that's the blue line, that is completely normally distributed as expected. So these behave as R.A. Fisher expected them to behave. However, if we put the apolipoprotein E uh, gene into the equation, we get a kind of a humpback that is... Uh, showing us the effect of the APOE4 gene that is driving most of these extreme risks. That's something to keep in mind. It's not unique. I mean, you see it also in uh, a lot of autoimmune diseases where HLA does this to the disease risk. But it's something to take uh, into account when thinking about embedding uh, genetics into trials. <coughs> 
Now, one of the questions that is often asked is, why do you see only APOE? Why don't you see uh, the amyloid precursor protein gene has a much larger effect in risk? Um, why don't you see the presenilins, uh, same story, or TREM2, uh, or the ABCA7 genes? And that has to do with frequency. Of course, these um, genes are much more rare. So on the axis is giving the frequency of uh, carriership. And as the genes are very rare, you actually hardly see an effect in your genetic risk score because there's too few people to push that risk score up for these genes. So that gives us uh, the sobering idea that APOE uh, is an, uh, an enormous driver of the disease, even more so in the population than these rare variants. So what did we learn from the genome? And that is just uh, a lesson that we can take forward to trials. So I think we learned a lot. I think when I started working on Alzheimer's disease 30 years ago, we were very targeted to neuronal damage. Now, more and more, of course, with the, uh, the um, discovery that apolipoprotein E is a major driver, first our attention went to the astrocyte, because that is the cell in the brain that expresses most of the apolipoprotein E. But now we're moving to the glia, and that has to do not only with apolipoprotein E being expressed there, but also many of the other genes that we have identified are expressed in that cell type. So that, of course, involves TREM2 and its pathway. It uh, involves HLA. And uh, it involves also one of the newer kits on the block in terms of uh, the pathology involved is the lysosomal uh, problems that you see in Alzheimer's disease emerging that involve BIN1, uh, but also PCOM and granulin. So taking this uh, forward to trials, how can we use our genetic information in trials? Well, the first obvious thing is, of course, that if you think of our trials, and have been highlighted already by uh, Professor Cummings, is clearly that we want to do our trials earlier and earlier because we want to prevent this disease rather than treat the disease. And if we must develop the disease, we want to develop it at an oldest age possible in uh, good health being in up until the oldest age possible um, due to the medication. So that works pretty well. If one wants to detect patients at a high risk, persons at a high risk in the population that may have a high risk or a very low risk of the disease, that works pretty well if we just combine the information of the apolipoprotein E genotype, and that's the one on the most uh, left side of the graph uh, for you, that gives the combination of the two allele carriers, the free freeze and the uh, heterozygous for four and the homozygous for four. And it gives you an impression how the risk of the disease develops over age. So if one needs to do a trial on APOE2 carriers or free free carriers, you see that most people will stay in the green zone and that's on the low risk zone. And that means also that if you would like to include these people in the trials and you would like to shorten the duration of the trial like all of us want, because four years is already long, one would have to start a trial rather at old age than at young age, because then you would have to wor uh, w wait for tens or two decades perhaps before somebody will develop the disease. What you also see is that in the APOE44 carriers, you often are already around the, eight, uh, uh, the age of 85, already on the 60% risk zone, and uh, you're on the 40% risk zone uh, if you have a low risk of other genes caused in this APOE44 group. So basically what we try to do here in our paper in Nonset Neurology is to make a kind of risk chart, which we are very used to in cardiovascular disease, where you often are presented with your risk of cardiovascular disease based on your cholesterol, your blood pressure, your glucose levels, and your hemostasis. If you have uh, inflammation, you get a kind of a chart that uh, indicates to you how high your risk is of developing heart disease. Well, we're quite 
close that we can do an equivalent uh, a, uh, um, an chart in terms of the AUC, so in terms of predictive values for genetic risk factors. Now, of course, um, there's a lot of interest on uh, genes uh, of uh, over the, uh, the decades, but uh, the, the recent uh, interest is, of course, the blood-based biomarkers, and that has hyped a lot of interest, I think, in also in epidemiology, but also in clinical trials uh, settings. Well, it sparked also a lot of interest in a paper that we published earlier in Alzheimer's dementia, and that's a paper that targeted specifically uh, A-beta levels in blood. And why we should, uh, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of requests uh, to make this data publicly available, and they are, if you're interested, you, we will provide, provide them. But this is one of the largest studies in which we a bet that uh, 40 and 42 were uh, studied in epidemiological studies. So we pulled all these studies together of all the different uh, cohorts and studies which were the genetic drivers of uh, A-beta levels of people who were healthy. They were not uh, developing Alzheimer's disease. They were not selected for that. But what are the genes that drive your A-beta levels in blood? Now, most of you may guess that it's not always amyloid is coming from the brain that you see in blood. Actually, most of it comes for the platelets. And that was the argument always that this would not be a good biomarker, despite the fact in epidemiological research, a beta is associated in blood, definitely also uh, to the risk of Alzheimer's disease in the future. Well, what was notable of this study? Well, the notable of this study, if we look at both of the, the common variants that predict the disease, but also the rare variants that we could find and use in a sort of aggregated form, that what you see emerging, that almost what the genes that are um, determining genetically the levels of amyloid in the blood are almost uh, the ones that we suspect as the usual culprits in Alzheimer's disease. That's the presenilin 2, base 1, uh, APP, but also APOE and APOC1 for a beta 42. So how can this be used? I think the combination, what we should think of, I think most of the uh, uh, blood-based biomarker um, ideas of uh, in trials are using them as, as an, uh, really a predictor of the disease on the short notice, but if you were to do a, a study that really was preventive, the combination of apolipoprotein E and the other genes together with a blood-based biomarker targeting for A-beta would be a very strong uh, way of selecting people with that are on the way uh, towards uh, Alzheimer pathology. What do we further uh, know? Well, if you think about trials and how to use genetics in there, you can also think about personalizing the trajectories that you expect in the patients as well as the clinical phenotypes. So this goes back to the other, uh, the paper I started out with, with the EADB consortium, which uh, uh, also included a number of studies which were either population-based, like uh, on the left, uh, uh, the 3C study, which was based in general population, and also studies that are based on MCI patients, so those with cognitive impairment, and on the right side, uh, you see the study uh, of uh, the Barcelona group from this year, the ACE cohort. So what we plotted here is what the uh, risk on the one hand of the diseases in the 3C study in the general population for those who are in the top and the lowest decile. And you see that these trage trajectories are clearly different. The, the confidence interval are not overlapping at all. But for the first time, what we also start seeing that in MCI patients, the genetic risk score, the, the ones in the extreme deciles become predictive now. That is a major leap forward. Up until now, there was a lot of debate whether that was possible, but we see these individualized trajectories emerging. Now, the other thing we've been working on, and uh, that, that do not uh, try to read this, but it's just to remind me, is that, that we've been 
trying to translate really the, the genetics into a more uh, new thinking in Alzheimer's disease in clinic uh, for a while. And one of the ideas that really um, attracts me as an epidemiologist is using a more probabilistic model of Alzheimer's disease in which you really are revising the amyloid hypothesis in a uh, realistic way. So what the idea behind the paper was is just take the daring step, try to think in Alzheimer's disease, not as a single disease, but rather start uh, distinguishing very simply first autosomal dominant disease, like a lot of trials, the Diane trials have been doing, and start distinguishing the, the patients in APOE4 uh, plus and minus. And then I think the, the, the trick of this paper was, which I very much like, and it's work in progress, I think we're not uh, at all at the end, Look at the differences in pathology that you see. So, for instance, uh, the ATN criteria we extensively reviewed. Nothing new in there, but reviewed them in the light of genetics. So that concerned the amyloid pathology, the tau, uh, neurodegeneration, but also these, these unexpected pathways that are keep popping up, such as uh, TDP. 43, that we usually think of as, uh, as more ALS, FDD. Uh, alpha synuclein, usually we think of as PD, and uh, cerebral uh, angio amyloid uh, angiopathy. So the nice thing is it gave us new ideas, and it gave us a different pictures that we can make into a picture, which is very relevant for trials, just not as a stratification, that could be a stratification, but also to look at specific markers in specific subgroups. And that is one of the targets, I think, that most of the people working in industry are looking for. Is there a subgroup in these Alzheimer patients that we can identify and may explain that a set of patients reacts better or worse on a certain a subset? Now, my colleague Richard Ains uh, will comment on this further. Should we do this stratified? Should you do your stratified uh, uh, trial? Do, do it, design it as stratified according to these divisions? Or should you do that uh, post hoc, but describe it in the uh, design protocol? I think there's a, quite an argument for what is seen in COVID-19 research, that you should rather do it in the end of the study than at the start because usually the unexpected findings um, are seen uh, in these analysis, but it's uh, definitely worth the effort. So can we identify subgroups? And that has uh, been a quite interesting exercise because one of the questions we always had in our genetic analysis is these genes don't work by themselves, right? Because they often have small effects they work in teams and they work in pathways. So the trick has always been, how are these uh, genes uh, uh, grouped? And that is usually done on a biological pathway, but often these pathways are not much based on the brain, but rather on what we see in uh, atypical cellular mechanisms. Now, what we did in this study is we pulled in the EADB set all the data that were available in uh, CSF uh, for A beta 42 and P tau, and we looked for the genes that were driving these levels. And again, we found that APOE, for instance, is a very much a determinant from CSF uh, A, A beta 42. But we also did another trick: is we took the 80 genes that we had found in uh, associated to Alzheimer's disease in this huge data set of 100,000 patients and started clustering those. So what you find then is a new way of clustering in which you, based on CSF, you see an effect which genes together seem to cluster in terms of their effect of uh, CSF A beta 42, and that includes uh, several genes. But some of them also have an effect on P tau. So if we look at this first group of genes, and you probably cannot read it, but it's uh, 
includes BIN1, uh, ABC7, and uh, several other genes, APP, that you would expect in that uh, cluster. But we also see a second cluster that involves uh, granulin, for instance, and many interleukins that specifically go to the effects on P-tau. Well, if you go back to uh, the other clusters that uh, are emerging, I think you, see, you could see an, uh, a pattern emerging that you could use in future studies, of course, to uh, look at subgroups in a trial in a post hoc analysis. So this is again an, uh, an approach that could be extended. I definitely think we should extend it, uh, if possible, to uh, other outcomes, GFAP, NFL, but also other proteomics outcomes that may be of use to uh, cluster or genes and get meaningful pathways. So summing up, what have we learned from genetics? I hope I can convince, uh, convince you that, that APO lipoprotein is indeed an elephant in the rooms, and I think most of the trials have always stratified for APOE and looked at, for instance, uh, side effects specific to this gene. I think what we also learned from genetics that there are very distinct pathways with very uh, different clinical phenotypes that may be relevant for your trial design, but also definitely for the trial uh, interpretation. Now, of course, there's a not a lot to discover still. And what I think the main thing that, that, that I think that should be considered also is look at side effects and the genetics of there. That is a field that is quite open. If, I, if you would uh, argue, well, has this field been been uh, incredibly successful in other diseases. No, the pharmacogenetics have not been e easy. However, in some disorders in psychiatrics, there is quite some evidence that uh, P450, but also uh, various other genes determine your side effects. And that is something uh, definitely to be considered. That hasn't been considered to the depth and uh, breadth that is possible with the current genomics. With that, thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Professor. My name is Ross. I'm an old age psychiatrist from Orkney, Manchester. Um, I didn't set out in old age psychiatry to be a genetic counsellor, but I am now, for my patients in clinical trials of disease-modifying agents, telling them their APOE status, um, because some of them are excluded, because they have such severe side effects from, for example, TREM2 inhibitors or uh, activators, and uh, some of the people in anti-amyloid uh, anti -amyloid antibody studies are also um, at greater risk of, of ARIA changes of, of uh, brain, brain edema and uh, microhemorrhages because of their APOE status. It's not something we currently test in the NHS, and when we've asked, no genetic counsellor is interested. Um, so should we be testing our patients? I, th I think it's, you should, and I think definitely um, there's been a lot of studies done on APOE disclosure, how much of an effect that will have on the patient. Um, that discussion has been studied, for instance, uh, in, in Boston has really studied that in depth in the research center, but uh, of course the question also came up that if you have this uh, direct to consumer test, you also reveal people's uh, APOE st status. I think the risk is manageable as long as you are open up at, uh, on front, but up front, but I think if you look at the Lecanabab trials, I think, I think that is for me, one of the trials that shows that APOE4 must be considered. My question is, uh, there must be more genes that, that, that have, may have effects, and it may be even not single genes, but rather pathways that we should consider in these trials. And that may in the end be helpful, I think, for also the trialist to have at least an idea that the side effects either are attributed to Alzheimer genes, but you could also argue that it may be complete non-AD-related pathways that will pop up. But APOE, I, I agree, is, is, is the most important one up until now. <laughs>
question. 